Greetings and welcome. I'm Bruce Corey, Dean of the College of Business at Concordia University in St. Paul, Minnesota. I invite you to join me in a conversation with some of America's greatest leaders, uh, Stephen Douglas, Abraham Lincoln, and the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. They are portrayed by uh, professionals and actors in Minnesota. Uh, Professor David Woodard, uh, plays the role of uh, Stephen Douglas. Uh, Tabor Aiken, a school principal, plays the role of uh, Abraham Lincoln. And Warren Bowles, a noted local artist, plays the role of Dr. King. Uh, these actors are going to respond from historical materials from the characters they are portraying. At the core of the uh, discussions that we are having these days, is a fundamental question, who is an American? And this question runs through American history and is reflected in the conversation that you're going to hear today. I now invite you to sit back and listen to these great leaders as they debate this great question of our times and other similar questions that this would lead to. Ladies and gentlemen, I now present to you our distinguished guests who will introduce themselves to you, beginning with uh, Senator Douglas. Uh, I'm Stephen Douglas. I'm currently a United States Senator from the great state of Illinois. I've served that state in the Senate from 1847 to the present. Uh, before that, I held numerous offices in the state of Illinois, the legislature, state's attorney, secretary of state, Justice of the Supreme Court, and I was also a member of the House from uh, 1843 to 1847. In Congress, I have been proud to serve on the Committee of Territories, where I have written, modified, and sponsored bills for the creation of seven territories, Oregon, Minnesota, Utah, New Mexico, Washington, Kansas, and Nebraska. I also played a key role in the passage of the 1850 Compromise Bill, which helped to avert a sectional crisis, and also brought California into the Union. And I introduced the 1854 Kansas and Nebraska Bill, which advanced popular sovereignty, allowing the people in the territories to decide on the great political questions of the day. I was born in 1813 in Vermont, and I moved west when I was a young man. I came looking for adventure and opportunity. I found Illinois, and I soon declared it to be the paradise of the world and I became a Western man in my outlook and my politics. Thank you. Herewith is a little sketch of me as requested. There is not much of it. The reason, I suppose, is there is not much of me. Every man is said to have his peculiar ambition. Whether it be true or not, I cannot say. For one that I have no other so great as being truly esteemed of my fellow men, but rendering myself worthy of their self-esteem. I have served in both the Illinois House of Representatives as well as the United States House of Representatives. And if any personal description of me is thought desirable, it may be said that I am six feet, four inches in height, lean in flesh, weighing on average 180 pounds, dark complexion with coarse black hair, gray eyes, and no other marks or brands recollected. Well, I was born in the South, Atlanta, Georgia, and I lived there all of my early years. In fact, I attended the public schools of Atlanta. I went to college in Atlanta, Morehouse College, part of the Atlanta University system. From Morehouse, I went to Crozier Theological Seminary in Pennsylvania. I then attended Boston University, where I earned a PhD in philosophical theology. I then became pastor of the Dexter Avenue Baptist Church in Montgomery, Alabama. It was there that I took part in the Montgomery bus boycott, which led to my work in the civil rights movement and with the Southern Christian Leadership Conference of which I am president. I've received numerous awards for my work in the civil rights movement, most notable being the Nobel Prize for Peace, which I received in 1964. I am married to Coretta Scott King, we have four children, two sons, two daughters, my eldest Yolanda, Martin III and his brother Dexter, and our youngest Bernice. 
I currently co-pastor with my father, the Ebenezer Baptist Church in Atlanta, Georgia. Thank you, gentlemen. Today we are joined also by members of the local community and the ethnic press that will interact with you at a later time. I would like to begin with the first question and seek your insights to this question, who is an American? Senator Douglas? Who is an American? I, I hold that the signers of the Declaration of Independence had no reference to Negroes at all when they declared that all men are created equal. They did not mean Negroes, nor Indians, nor Fiji Islanders, nor any other race. They were speaking solely of white men. They alluded to men of European birth and European descent, to white men and to none others when they declared that doctrine. I hold that this government was established on the white basis. It was established by white men for the benefit of white men and their posterity forever and should be administered by white men and none others. I say to you, in all frankness, gentlemen, that in my opinion, the Negro is not a citizen, cannot be a citizen, ought not be a citizen under the Constitution of the United States. But while I hold that our Constitution and political system holds the Negro to not be a citizen, it does not follow by any means that he should or must be a slave. On the contrary, we should extend to the Negro race and all other dependent races all the rights, all the privileges, and all the immunities which they can exercise consistently within the safety of our society. Humanity requires this. Christianity commands that we extend these privileges to these races. The question then arises, what are these privileges and what is the nature and extent of them? My answer is that this is a question that must be answered by each state. We in Illinois have decided it for ourselves. We tried slavery. We kept it for 12 years, finding that it was not profitable. We abolished it for that reason and became a free state. We have said that in this state of Illinois, the Negro shall not be a slave, nor shall he be a citizen. Now, Kentucky holds a different doctrine. Let Kentucky adopt a policy to suit itself. If we do not like it, we will keep away from them. If she does not like our policy, she will stay at home, mind her own business, and let us alone. If the people in all states will act upon this great principle and each state mind its own business, attend to its own affairs, take care of its own citizens, and not meddle with its neighbors, there will be peace between all sections of this country and the entire union. The great principle of this government is that each state has a right to do as it pleases on all of these questions, and no other state or no power on earth has the right to interfere, to complain, just because their system is different. In the Compromise Measures of 1850, Mr. Clay declared this the great principle that ought to be followed by the states and the territories, and I reasserted this doctrine in the Kansas-Nebraska Bill in 1854. Thank you. <clears throat> we are now a mighty nation. We are 30, or about 30 million people, and we own and inhabit about 1 15th of the dry land of the whole earth. In, as in some other way connected with this rise of prosperity, we find a race of men living in that day whom we claim as fathers and grandfathers. They were iron men. They fought for the principle that they were contending for. And we understood that by what they did, it was then a degree of prosperity would be benefited to us. We now enjoy that prosperity. And in every way, we are better than our fathers better in the age and race and country in which we live, but we have not yet reached the whole. There is something else connected with it. We have, besides these men, descended from blood by our ancestors, among us perhaps half our people. Half our people who are not descendants at all of these men. They have come from Europe. German, Irish, French, and Scandinavian, men that have come from Europe themselves or whose ancestors have come, and have settled here, finding themselves our equals in all things. If they look back through this history to trace their connection with those by blood, they will find that they have none. They cannot carry themselves back into that glorious epoch and make themselves feel that they are a part of us. But 
when they look through that Declaration of Independence, then they find that those old men, our fathers, say that we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal. And then they feel that moral sentiment taught in that day, evidence of the relationship to those men, that it is the father of all moral principle in them, and that they have a right to claim it as though they were blood of the blood and the flesh of those men that wrote the Declaration. And so they are. That it is the electric cord in the Declaration that links the hearts of patriotic and liberty-loving men together that will link those patriotic hearts as long as the love of freedom exists in the men, minds of men throughout the world. Dr. King. Who is an American? When we are trained to write in a scholarly fashion, we are told that we should try to write in the active, not passive voice, and in the positive, not negative form. Now, it would be improper and impertinent for me to imply that you have some hidden agenda when you ask this question, but still, when I hear the question, I cannot help but think that we are seeking an answer to the negative form of the question. Who is not an American? Unlike um, the Germans, the Irish, the French, the Scandinavian, and other immigrant groups who came to this country willingly, we Negroes were forced here against our will. Now, Professor Thomas Pettigrew has pointed out that the American slavery that brought us here is, distingu is distinguished from all other forms of slavery because it consciously dehumanized the Negro. In Greece and Rome, for example, slaves preserved dignity and a measure of family life. But still, we Negroes consider ourselves true Americans and freely embrace those magnificent words that the architectures of our republic wrote in the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence. It is truly our hope and our faith that one day this nation will rise up and live out the true meaning of its creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. And your question, is most likely prompted by the modern discussion of illegal immigration, with emphasis on that all-important modifier, illegal. Now, everyone who sneaks into the country or overstays a visa is breaking a federal law. But there are laws, and then there are laws. Obviously, not all laws are moral, and breaking those laws is an act of morality. Now, we should never forget that everything Adolf Hitler did in Germany was legal, and everything that the Hungarian freedom fighters did in Hungary was illegal. It was illegal to aid and comfort a Jew in Hitler's Germany. Even so, I am sure that had I lived in Germany at the time, I would have aided and comforted my Jewish brothers. Now, Almost exactly one month after the signing of the uh, Voting Rights Act of 1965, the National Farm Workers Association, led by Cesar Chavez and his colleague Dolores Huerta, started the Delano Grape Strike. Now, I have always considered them as brothers in the fight for equality. Uh, the fight for equality must be fought on many fronts, in uh, the urban slums, in the sweatshops of the factories and the fields. Our separate struggles are really one struggle, a struggle for freedom, for dignity, and for humanity. But Chavez has stated that for so many years, we have been involved in agricultural strikes. And it is apparent that when the farm workers strike and their strike is successful, the employers go to Mexico and have unlimited, unrestricted use of illegal alien strike breakers to break the strike. And for over 30 years, the Immigration and Naturalization Service has looked the other way and assisted in the strike breaking. I do not remember one single instance in the 30 years where the Immigration Service has removed strike breakers. Now, we are 
outraged by the great immorality of importing a slave class into this country, especially one that has robbed so many Negroes of their hard-won livelihoods. But once we have illegally and immorally imported this slave class, do we not have a responsibility to them? I am not implying that we do not have the right and the duty to secure and protect our borders. It is just a very complex question. Thank you, gentlemen. What I hear you say, Senator Douglas, that an American is someone whom the majority decides has the credential to be a citizen. While Dr. King, uh, you speak about the American identity that is incomplete without the full inclusion of all citizens. While Ms. Lincoln states that anyone who shares the moral sentiment in the Declaration of Independence is a citizen, an American in its truest sense. So let's uh, move to a slightly different question. Uh, what are the major issues important for the country's future? Uh, Senator Douglas? Contrary to what you will hear, the major issue in my day is not slavery. It is the right of people in every community to make their own laws, to establish their own institutions to suit themselves. Now, I claim no particular credit for advocating these principles. The principle of popular sovereignty, which I will speak of a lot today, is as old as free government itself. It was the principle on which every battle of the American Revolution was fought. Remember for one moment, my friends, this was the cause that led to the Revolutionary War. What was the demand of our Revolutionary Fathers? The denial which produced the war. It was not independence. In the beginning of that controversy, our Founding Fathers did not desire independence. In every petition to the Crown, in every address to the Parliament, in every address to the people of England, our Fathers sat up and protested their devotion to the British Constitution and their loyalty to the Crown of England. What were they contending then if it was not independence? They were contending the right of self-government in the colonies. They demanded the right in their own local legislatures to pass laws which affected the local and domestic concerns of the respective colonies. Now let me tell you a little personal story. I was passing through Indiana the other day and a gentleman who was working in the ears called my attention to an old piece of continental money which said, mind your own business. Another farmer called my attention to an old Massachusetts coin. On the reverse side, it said, mind your own business. That was the creed of our revolutionary fathers. That was what they said to the British Parliament when they attempted to force slavery on the colony of Virginia against his will. That's what our fathers said to the British government when they attempted to control our people in the local and domestic affairs and dictate what kind of paper we should write on. Our fathers said to the British government, hands off, mind your own business, and in order that they might perpetuate that model and render it familiar to their children, they placed those words on their paper money and on their coins. Let us now act upon that principle and say to Congress and say to the people, mind your own business and let the states and territories decide. Thank you, sir. We are a great empire. We are 80 years old. We stand at once the wonder and the admiration of the whole world. And we must inquire as to what it is that has given us so much prosperity. And we shall understand that to give up one thing would be to give up all future prosperity. This is a cause that every man, as I have done, can make himself. It has been said that such a race of prosperity has been run nowhere else. But we can see a people who, while they boast of being free, keep their fellow beings in bondage. Because of this, our progress in degeneracy seems to be very rapid. As a nation, we began by declaring that all men are created equal. We now practically read it as all men are created equal except Negroes. When it comes to this, I should prefer emigrating to some country where they make no pretense of loving liberty, to Russia, for instance, where depotism can be taken pure and without the base alloy of hypocrisy. Our founding, founding fathers meant for slavery to fade away 
and they restricted it from the new territories, legislated to cut off its source by the abrogation of the slave trade, thus putting the seal of legislation against its spread. The public mind did rest, did rest in the belief that it was in the course of ultimate extinction. By straying from the Declaration and the works of our founding fathers, we have made slavery a major issue, an issue that blocks the progress of this great empire. There is a need for a radical restructuring of the architecture of American society. For its very survival sake, America must re-examine old presuppositions and release itself from many things that for centuries have been held sacred. For the evils of racism, poverty, and militarism to die, a new set of values must be born. Our economy must become more person-centered than property and profit-centered. Our government must depend more on its moral power than on its military power. Now, we must become creative dissenters who will call our beloved nation to a higher destiny, to a new plateau of compassion, to a more noble expression of humaneness. We must have a passion for peace, born out of wretchedness and the miseries of war, giving our ultimate allegiance to the empire of justice. We must be that colony of dissenters seeking to imbue our nation with the ideas of a higher and nobler order. So in dealing with the particular dilemma of the Negro, we will challenge the nation to deal with its larger dilemma. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, please forgive me for trying to condense your profound insights in, in a summary form at the end here, but we have in our audience uh, even a sixth grader, and people like me also leak, seek to uh, understand your core uh, insight. And so what I understand, the major issue, according to Senator Douglas, is that uh, the issue was not slavery, but the right of the people to make their own laws, that liberty. While Mr. Lincoln and Dr. King uh, were concerned that unless this liberty included all, we will be falling short of this, the vision of this country that is embodied in the Declaration of Independence. So the obvious question next is, uh, what is the consequence of America not moving beyond these issues of race, gender, class? Uh, can we start again with Mr. Douglas? Being transfixed on these racial issues in this country will lead to violence. And the end will be that we will not, as a country, grow economically and territorially. Our republic can endure permanently divided into slave and free states as our founding fathers made it. We need not become all free. We need not become all slave. If we try to legislate slavery in or out of this country, we are inviting warfare between the North and the South to be carried out with ruthless vengeance until one section or the other shall be driven to the wall and become the victim of the other. This sectional warfare will be waged between Northern and Southern states until they shall all become uniform in their local and domestic institutions. If we keep up this current rhetoric about uniformity, we shall surely lead to a war. It will yield to those who foolishly claim that the Republic cannot endure permanently half slave or half free. By these propositions that you hear in my day, you are saying to the South, if you desire to maintain your institutions as they are now, you must not be satisfied with minding your own business. You must invade Illinois and all the other northern states, establish slavery in them, and make them universal. And in the same language, we are saying to the North, you must not be content with regulating your own affairs and minding your own business. But if you desire to maintain your freedom, you must invade the southern states, abolish slavery, and there and everywhere in order, in order to have all the states one thing or the other. I say this is the inevitable result of these arguments. Judge Douglas wishes to label me as a fool for believing as I do he has the right, and I in turn have the right to believe that a house divided against itself cannot stand. 
I believe this government cannot endure permanently half slave and half free. I do not expect the union to be dissolved. I do not expect the house to fall, but I do expect that it will cease to be divided. It will become all one thing or all the other. Either the opponents of slavery will arrest the further spread of it and place it where the public mind shall rest in the belief that it is in the course of ultimate extinction where our founding fathers placed it, or its advocates will push it forward till it should become alike lawful in all states, north as well as south. Many of the early pages of American history have been obscured and forgotten. A society is always eager to cover misdeeds with a cloak of forgetfulness, but no society can fully repress an ugly past when the ravages persist into the present. History has shown that, like a virulent disease germ, racism can grow and destroy nations. America owes a debt of justice, which it has only begun to pay. If it loses the will to finish or slackens its determination, history will recall its crimes and the country that would be great will lack the most indispensable element of greatness, justice. So, uh, Senator Douglas, uh, you're of, of the opinion that if we are transfixed on racial issues in this country, this will lead to violence and, and the end to economic prosperity, while uh, Mr. Lincoln was concerned that a house divided against itself cannot stand. And for Dr. King, it would be fatal to the nation to overlook the urgency of the moment. As an economist, uh, as, and, and lacking numbers, I, I appreciated an estimate of, of the Civil War on society, about 600,000 lives were lost, and an estimate of about $81 billion impact to the economy. And if we try to estimate the impact of slavery on the lives of people who were part of that, that would go into the trillions. So in terms of consequences, we never know the opportunities that we have lost uh, and the opportunities and the possibilities that could be there in the future. So my final question to you is, what is Americans, America's role in the world today? Um, well, in my, in my day, I was called an expansionist. I have been an advocate of manifest destiny for many years, uh, uh, for as long as that term has been around. I've been a champion of the Texas annexation I was for all of Oregon, and I strongly and consistently supported the Mexican War. In addition, I've been attempting to secure resources to build a railroad from the Mississippi River to the Pacific Ocean, one that would ultimately aid our trade routes in that area of the world. I am also a strong advocate of a Central American canal route, even if it means occupation of some of the countries in that area. As such, I am also for the full acquisition of Cuba, whenever that island can be fully uh, obtained, consistent with the laws of the nations and honor of this country. Let me explain what I mean in a little further, however, by expansion. I mean not only extending the natural boundaries of the United States, but I also mean the growth and development of this great nation in other ways, politically, economically, and socially. <clears throat> the resources, advantages, and powers of the American people are very great and they have consequently succeeded to equally great responsibilities. It seems to have devolved upon us to test whether a government established on the principles of human freedom can be maintained against an effort to build one upon the exclusive foundation of human bondage. If the great American people will only keep their temper on both sides of the line, the troubles will come to an end, and the question which now distracts the country will be settled just as surely as all of the other difficulties of like character which have originated in this government have been adjusted. Let the people on both sides keep their self-possession, and just as other clouds have passed, so will this, and this great nation shall continue to prosper as heretofore. 
some years ago, a famous novelist died. Among his papers was found a list of suggested plots for stories, um, the most prominently underscored being this one. A widely separated family inherits a house in which they have to live together. This is the great problem, new problem of mankind. We have inherited a large house, a great world house in which we all have to live together, black and white, Easterner and Westerner, Gentile and Jew, Catholic and Protestant, Muslim and Hindu, a family unduly separated in ideas, culture, and interest, who, because we can never live apart, must somehow learn to live with each other in peace. Today, our very survival depends on our ability to adjust to new ideas, to remain vigilant and to face the challenge of change. The large house in which we live demands that we transform this worldwide neighborhood into a worldwide brotherhood. Together, we must learn to live as brothers, or together we will be forced to perish as fools. In the days ahead, we must not consider it unpatriotic to raise certain basic questions about our national character. We must begin to ask, why are there 40 million poor people in a nation overflowing with such unbelievable affluence? Why has our nation placed itself in the position of being God's military agent on earth and intervened recklessly in foreign lands? Why have we substituted the arrogant undertaking of policing the whole world for the high task of putting our own house in order? For Mr. Lincoln, uh, there were great resources that this country is endowed with, and so uh, even greater are the responsibilities that come with it. For Douglas, it is the expansion, America's role is in the expansionist philosophy to, together with the spreading of our free institutions around the world. And for King, uh, America should be that beacon of light, that cause this community of brotherhood in the world, that creates this community of brotherhood in the world. We'll now uh, transition to the part of the program where we, we will interact with our audience. I'd like to introduce members of the ethnic press and the local community that is joining us for this conversation, uh, beginning with Marsha Murray, who is a community member, uh, Al McFarlane, who is the uh, publisher of Inside News, uh, Christina Corey, a sixth grade student, uh, Ni Hun, the publisher of Asian American Press, and Hayat Mahmud, a student at the University of Minnesota. Welcome, everybody. And uh, please free to come up and ask your questions of these gentlemen who are now out of their character and but will respond with the combined insights of their character as well as from their own. How was the, the attitude of society towards women uh, in leadership positions? And then the second part to that is, have things changed today? Have they really changed today? I, I think that that's a very key thing, that uh, the idea of a woman's responsibility, a woman's place, was very fixed, I'm sure, in the 19th century, but even into well into the 20th century. The idea of women in leadership positions was very difficult for society as a whole, and I think therefore some of the institutions that we are talking about to deal with. Yes, even in the 19th century, you have Harriet Tubman, you know, you have Sojourner Truth, you, in the abolitionist movement, you have the work of Harriet Beecher Stowe and other women. Women were being very involved, taking real leadership positions, but it wasn't well recognized. Even in Dr. King's day, it not well recognized. Today, well, we have a woman who is viably running for president of the United States. We have Condoleezza Rice, a secretary of state. We had uh, Madeleine Albright, a secretary of state. I really think attitudes have changed. I hope so. Most nations already have had some leaders that are women. Sooner or later, we'll get there. And we're talking a lot about formal leadership roles. I think there may have also been a lot of informal leadership roles behind the scenes. Certainly, Mrs. Lincoln's wife gets a lot of press uh, and 
invariably has a, it's a bad name. But I think there was a lot of uh, things happening that we didn't talk about or we don't see in uh, modern press materials about what uh, specifically wives were doing with their husbands who were in political leadership roles and how they were influencing that and what kind of uh, feedback and so forth they were sharing with them. And in, it was 1848, uh, right, at Seneca Falls where the first women's movement convention uh, got together. So even in our day, Mr. Lincoln and I's day, uh, women were starting to organize politically and uh, they were a big part of the abolitionist movement. Uh, now, uh, that wouldn't put them in what we would call leadership positions, traditional leadership positions, but they were making their voices heard politically in, in our day, uh, or at least starting to. And what about uh, reports like uh, in the U.S. News uh, Re World Report about a woman who played a role in the army or one of the first African-American entrepreneur that worked for uh, Mary Lincoln. Mm -hmm. uh, the f uh, spies we mentioned yeah. that there were uh, 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 Rose Greenhow, who was a famous uh, s Southern spy in Washington during the war. Well, I you know I, I don't know if a spy is a leadership position. I guess it is, <laughs> uh, but there were also as, as that article mentions uh, a lot of women who dressed up as men to fight in the war. Uh, so you can see women starting to get out of the traditional roles that society had affixed for them, and it's the beginning of something that takes years to uh, come to fruition, but we see it in our time period. Uh, how do you think America exercised moral leadership back then, and how does it exercise leadership today? Well, I'll jump in right away and talk a little bit about the Lincoln and Douglas relationship because specifically it I think that the the idea of moral leadership comes out in the debates of 1858 and they had these seven debates and when you go back and forth and read the material that's the perspective that I see is I see Lincoln bringing out asking moral questions he has some issues that are clearly bothering him and he's exploring them and Douglas um, may have some of those issues. We don't know from the material whether he does or not, but he's operating very much on a political platform. He has some issues that he wants to deal with, and uh, slavery being the largest one that continually comes up in there is a moral issue for Lincoln, and he's exploring this. And it truly comes out when he's asked specific questions about what are you going to do? If you didn't have slavery, what would you do with the slaves? He, he doesn't have an answer. That's not a politically savvy approach. A, a modern politician would have a concrete plan put in place that they would be able to outline and they would email you the plan and you'd be able to read it. And Lincoln says, I don't know what to do. Maybe we should send them back to their home country. Maybe we should let them um, be uh, underlings. Um, or maybe we should just uh, let them be equals. But none of those are going to work. And so he's sort of exploring this in the course of the debate, whereas Douglas has the political approach. He's saying, this is a problem. It's hindering these things. Let's move on. So I think that uh, moral leadership is definitely there. It just depends on who the candidate is. And uh, what about today? What do you think uh, our parties and our country, uh, uh, how, do we, how do we grapple with moral leadership, moral leadership today? I, you know, I, I really, I, I think of the way the British Empire was, was founded and how they had such public principles. I think in the time period, certainly in the 19th century, but even into the 20th century, we, we had a show of morality and, and uh, making decisions based upon some moral principles. I think personally that that has changed over time and we have really uh, moved into the realm of the militarism that Dr. King was talking about. I think it probably came early in the, or, or midway through the 20th century. There is the old maxim, and I don't know it exactly, about Stalin being confronted with uh, the idea of what would the Pope say about this? And Stalin turning and saying, what do I care? How many divisions does the Pope have? And I think that's kind of where we're at today. There is that idea of might makes right. Uh, I would like to think that we're wrong. I think we long for some moral issues. We're trying to, to put a moral veneer on some of our, our decisions, but I think it's becoming clear that it is a moral veneer. I see that President Lincoln lost his beard. What is the role of personal appearances in politics? Have things changed today? 
I'll jump in and talk about President Lincoln losing his beard. Uh, the Lincoln I portray, I always refer to as pre-presidential Lincoln, 1858. Uh, Lincoln, uh, after w while he's a nominee for uh, president, uh, gets a, I have to tell the story just because I think it's a good story, gets a letter from a girl, Grace Bettle, she lives in, lived in Westfield, New York, and sent him a letter and said that she thought whiskers would be more presidential and that he should consider growing whiskers. She also goes on to delineate in her letter that her father's voting for him. If she could vote, she would vote for him. I think she was 11. And, uh, and her brothers, if they could vote, they would vote for him as well. And she's also inquiring as to whether he has any daughters, which of course he didn't. But uh, it's a cute letter, it's fun to read. And so then of course, uh, Lincoln grows a beard, he, you know, and then stops on his way out east after being elected president in New York and finds her at one of the rallies and greets her and thanks her for the idea and, you know, grew the beard in and so forth, so. Did appearances uh, matter for him? Or was I, his yeah. power of personality? What I mattered? think that they, uh, to a degree mattered, uh, for, specifically for Lincoln. I don't think that it was the um, core of who he was. I mean, he's repeatedly described as being um, gawky, lanky, um, that he's bony, and that you know when he's sitting, before he starts speaking, people are sort of looking at him going, oh, wow. Uh, and his pants are too short, his coat's too short, it doesn't fit well. So clearly he's not investing a lot in, in his appearance. He's not spending a lot of money on it. But then uh, Dave and I were talking the other day, sharing a story that uh, Lincoln made a trip out to New York for a speech and bought new shoes for the trip. So they probably weren't comfort shoes. He probably bought a pair of new shoes, so he was wearing new shoes when he appeared. So certainly it was, it was there. I think Douglas, you know, is the counter to uh, Lincoln not being well kept. Douglas was very well kept. When, when Douglas and Lincoln had their debates, Douglas wanted to make sure to show people that Lincoln was kind of a hayseed. So Douglas wore different colors, that's why I have the red vest. He would have had some gloves. I think I have some white gloves in my pocket somewhere. Maybe even a different color hat, uh, just to show that he was a little more cosmopolitan than Lincoln was. But remember, there wasn't any TV in our time. Mm -hmm. So most people didn't see these candidates. They voted because they were a member of the party that they liked, or they read their speeches. They didn't vote based on appearance. So it, generally, it wasn't that important. Now, I think it's very insightful and exciting that a person of your generation asks that particular question, because you, you are aware of a different world that even existed when I was young. The fact that right now you can do something, and at a moment's notice, someone can take a camera phone and take a picture of it, and it's on YouTube, and it's all over the world almost instantly. All of these men had some measure of moments where they had privacy. There is one picture that I saw that I have seen over the years that I've been working uh, uh, around uh, Dr. King of Dr. King uh, with a cigarette in his hand. Most people never think of Dr. King as smoking or having a vodka and orange juice. Uh, officials nowadays must be hyper aware of their appearance because they're always on camera. They never have a private moment and we will hold them to instances where they should have had privacy. It's why the candidates can talk about a moment of 3 a.m. in the morning. Well, who cares? We care because we're now watching all the time. That's a very good question. Uh, just to follow that also, does uh, appearances matter when it comes from the perspective of a minority person versus somebody like uh, Douglas or a Lincoln? Oh, I did that, grew. Did that happen? I mean, did it uh, apply to King, Dr. King? Uh, well, yes. I mean, you look at Dr. King, and, and Dr. King is almost always um, in, in a situation where he is dealing with establishment, where he's dealing with political figures, uh, when, when he's trying to negotiate things, you will always see him in the pastoral dark suit. But when he is out among the people, when he's on marches, he has a marching uniform, which is his walking shoes, and very often a, a more working class garb. Uh, if there's going to be press there, he's still going to be in the pastoral uh, uh, uniform. 
So, so yes, he, he was beginning to be aware, but that was the start of the, the television era. Yeah, the gentleman, um, political convention, political party now are busy those days. And I wonder, were political party and political convention more effective on those days? Well, the major difference is we didn't have primaries in our day. Uh, the conventions were very important. You didn't know what was going to happen until you got to the convention. Uh, and uh, uh, the party leaders would show up and they would vote, and uh, the candidates would try to do some campaigning with the party leaders, but you had no idea, so they were very, very important. Conventions in, in now are not that important anymore. Uh, I would guess in 15, 20 years, we won't even have conventions because everything's decided beforehand. So yeah, we, we had in our day, and Mr. Lincoln in our days, we had great political conventions. They were exciting. You didn't know what was gonna happen. Do we have more party uh, convention than like uh, now we have uh, beside the two system party, Democratic, Republican, and now we have Green Party and Independent Party? I, I, I think the party systems are still very important. I think they are powerful, and I think that's one of the reasons that we do have the third parties. We've had third parties almost every election that I have voted, uh, that I voted in as a person. I, I think this, I, I would kind of disagree. I would say that the political conventions are still very important, but they're really meaningless. They are a show. When I was growing up, even in the, uh, the mid 20th century, in the 60s, you didn't know what the results of the political conventions were going to be. Someone would come in with a certain amount of influence, but we have to wait until two or three o'clock in the morning to see if Kennedy is actually going to be nominated. Um, in uh, 1948, you know, you have uh, this little mayor from the Midwest who comes up and talks to the political convention about the civil rights movement and the responsibilities of the Democratic Party, and it creates a huge shift in both parties. The convention had a big effect. In 1967, 68, you have the Democratic Convention with the, uh, with the trying to see the, the, the Freedom Democratic Party uh, of Mississippi. Well, nowadays, the parties are going to avoid anything like that you know it is it is a pep rally it is um, yeah it's it's scripted. it's a show it's very scripted, it's very scripted. Uh, we, we did have a few uh third and fourth and fifth parties in the night in the mid 19th century but that was only because of slavery there was a, slavery caused a lot of splits in the party system basically it was still a two-party system with a few, a few times where you had a, the Liberty Party, the Free Soil Party, only because of slavery, and then the uh, parties, we got back to two parties after the war. Thank you. Going to the, the scripted thing about uh, the Republican convention, uh, I don't know if it was four years ago or eight years ago, that Libby Dole spoke to the convention. And everyone talked about, oh, the spontaneous way that Libby Dole stepped away from the platform and walked down out into the people. And I'm looking at that as a theater and television professional and going, yeah, but no one really paid attention to the fact that as she walked away from the platform and walked down to the steps, there just happened to be a wireless microphone waiting for her at the base and the lights came up on her as she stepped off of the stage. And the lights managed to follow her as she walked spontaneously through the audience. No, it, no it's meaningless now, it's a show. Um, I had a question, and my question is, as inspiring leaders, what are your insights for America today, especially in the eve of, um, of a major presidential election? Well, my thoughts, I, when I you know, think about that question, and of course the context that we're here today, think about what would Abraham Lincoln think about that particular piece. And I think as we've, we talked a little bit earlier about with you know, who are the presidential candidates and uh, having a woman as a, you know, as, a, as a strong contender for one of the uh, nominations would be one thing, but to have a black man be another one. I just try to think about how Abraham Lincoln, what his thoughts about that would be and 
I think it's one of those things that you can spend a lot of time thinking about, and I'm not going to come up with an answer because I'm not Abraham Lincoln, and I, I don't have a, a context of enough context about him to know where he would apply that. So I think that's it's an for me it's an interesting piece to think about and how that would fit in and where would what would that mean? But what would be the larger insight that Lincoln would have for today? If he were, if, if, if what would he say in terms of the political process, what he fought for, what he strived to achieve in America, would he be satisfied that that dream, that vision of his is being reflected in society today? I think he'd be uh, excited, he'd be gratified that some of those things, that, some, that the things he were fighting, that he was fighting for uh, became reality. But then I think there's so many other things out there that it wouldn't take very long to say, okay, well, that's good news, but here's bad news. And here's, here are the other issues that are still there. Um, and amidst that thing, trying to play the now and then game, I think the other piece that would be, that's interesting is to think about what else. I mean, there's so many other things from just the political piece, but then where would you be with technology, you know, with things like that? Where would those kind of things fit in into your mindset when you would just have no... Uh, premise for a computer, for example, or email or something like that. How would that fit in uh, along with trying to mix all the, uh, the political environment in there as well? So certainly I think he'd look back and say, well, it looks like that, you know, as unfortunate as it was, and he clearly didn't want the Civil War to take place, that there was a benefit in that. But then he would look back and say, look at how long it took to realize all those, what all those men died for. Um, it took so long for that to actually become worthwhile. And has it, are we still there? Have we succeeded? Have we achieved that, that goal, that dream? Are we there yet? Does the, does the declaration, um, do all men uh, are created equal? Can we actually really say that that statement's true and that we're, all, that we're living it? So would he say we are transfixed? With the problem of race, gender, class today, like at that time, or are we, do we have the ability to move all away from it? I don't know that he'd say we have the ability to move away from it. I think he'd say we're in a different spot, that the, that the issue has changed. But it's evolved. It's still there, but it just looks different than it did when he, when he was alive. What would King say? See, I've <laughs> always avoided the question of what would King say. I've, I was surprised. Uh, Clarence Jones uh, this last year came out with a book, um, a white attorney who had worked with Dr. King, of what would Martin say. Well, I have trouble with that only because most people can twist things to say, well, Martin would agree 100% with Warren Bowles on every <laughs> issue. Because you can twist their ideas in that way. What I think is rather important, and I think which is the way that I would encourage people, especially young people, to change the conversation is, what is your examination of the principles by which these men lived, and how would you apply them to the current situation? Because indeed, you are the one that must take the leadership position now. With King, I would say, let's look at his concept about militarism, right? And he speaks very directly to that and look at our modern society and say, okay, how does his principles fit here? We look at his questions about racism. Have we dealt with that? Or the third one that he, he most prominently dealt with, poverty. You know, let's not so much worry about what he would say now, but how we are going to deal with those issues and how we can apply ideas that we have learned from them. See, you're so much younger now, we can pass the baton off to you because you're the one that's going to have to really deal with it. Well, the, the, the thing I think is important about Douglas is he, he misses this moral question. That's why the, the, the Lincoln-Douglas debates are so important. Douglas thought everything could be... Um, uh, there was a political solution to everything. And there just simply are some moral questions that there's not some political solution. You can't go in the back room with your buddies and work out some deal. That's where Douglas was behind the times here. And that's why he provides a good contrast to uh, what we're talking about. Douglas thought slavery was just something that they could find a solution to and they could deal with it. And he didn't get how important it was morally. And there are issues today that may be important that you can't just make a political deal for. I don't know what it would be, human rights, uh, torture, uh, the other things we read about, but some things are so important, you can't just make a, write a bill 
and legislate them. And that's where Douglas was, I think, on the, the uh, losing side of this. I, I found, I don't know about the audience or us, but I found I learned a lot today. I've always known about the Lincoln-Douglas debates, but I've always known them in the abstract. And this kind of goes to our going back and actually examining what these people have said. I learned a, a lot about Douglas today, and I don't like him. <laughs> he was kind of a <laughs> supremacist. Uh, we, uh, when, when, uh, when we debate, uh, we've gone to a few county fairs and things like that. We make sure to tell people when Lincoln Douglas debated, it was a three hour debate. Uh, the first person spoke for an hour, then the second person spoke for an hour and a half, and then there was a half hour rejoinder. And there were up to 15,000 people that would stay and listen to these three hour debates. Families would bring their picnic lunch and everything, and this was a this was very important. Now, in your day, people don't debate for three hours, do they? Uh, and they debated for three hours, and it was uh, and that, it was entertainment. It was entertainment people were going at the time. To see this. Yeah. We think of a three-hour movie as too long. Yeah. So would Douglas be a libertarian? Um, not quite, because I think Douglas thought uh, in the in the question you asked about. Um, Railroad. When I spoke about railroads and internal improvements, which is a term used at the time about rivers and harbor improvements, Douglas thought the government should um, uh, help improve those things to help the economy. So he wasn't. He wouldn't have been a libertarian. But I think that the slavery issue forced um, forced Douglas to be against government control so they would stay out of the, the uh, uh, economy and keep slavery. I don't think he was a libertarian, though. So I guess we come to the end of our conversation with America's great leaders. And I want to thank uh, you for uh, joining us today. A question you might have is, why did we have these three great leaders, Lincoln, Douglas, and King? President Lincoln uh, defined who we are as a nation, that we are tied by the moral sentiment and the Declaration of Independence. And through that, he used the word, we are tied to the electoral cord. We are tied to a bond deeper than blood to the Founding Fathers. And Douglas, he helps, uh, like a master painter, he helps to uh, provide a contrast. He tries to provide a prism through which we could look at the brilliance of Lincoln's insights into who we are as, uh, as a nation, this moral nation. Dr. King, in many ways, uh, can be called the black Lincoln in American history because he championed and he articulated the same vision of Lincoln of we tied together around this country and the moral sentiment that lies in the Declaration of Independence. That defines who we are. And he reminds us to continue to, to, to hold to that important vision because that is what a lot of people in our past uh, struggled to achieve. And so these leaders in many ways offer our insights into this fundamental question of who is an American. And as we strive to bring and carry on this tradition of theirs into the future, we should remember the words of President Lincoln as he said at Gettysburg, in a larger sense, we cannot dedicate, we cannot consecrate, we cannot hallow this ground. It is rather for us to be here dedicated to the task remaining before us. And as Dr. King would say, let us go forth with an abiding faith in America and an audacious faith in the future of mankind. Thank you for joining us and hope you will join us into this journey that was started long ago.